Whose head? Whose? Do you hold in your arms? Da, 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 da. What do you see? Da, 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 da. I see. some serious way when I was 14. Oh, I knew it before that. But when I was 14, I began to write music and conceive of dramatic situations. And I said right then and there, I will not be straight-jacketed by anyone. I'm going to be completely free. off and on because I always took a job if I could find one. This was mostly during the Depression. It was one of the greatest experiences to be very tired of carrying a pack and throw it down by a nice beautiful brook and find sticks for a fire and build a fire and be careful not to start a fire that you don't want, of course. You come into a situation where everyone is a stranger and you have to make a decision very fast and you can say, Hey, Mac, uh, will you watch my pack while I go into town? And just suddenly, like this. And I've never been let down. Never. The, the friend, friendships and jealousies of boys were just fantastically intense. And 
I remember a couple of guys, they had suddenly had a quarrel. They were in the middle of a railroad bridge on the McCullinary River, and both of them threw their packs into the river and walked opposite directions. Of course, hobos are extraordinarily uh, individualistic people. That's why they're hobos. They cannot conform to the society that the strictures of a city you never find them in cities to speak of. I'm talking about the Depression, which is what I know best. But I doubt if people have changed. In other words, what I'm saying is that, that uh, there are the same kinds of people of today. There are the same kinds of people who will gotta go out on the road and thumb their nose at society and say, I am going to... I'm going to do everything by myself. I can remember taking a blanket out on the American River and saying, oh, thank heaven, thank heaven I don't have to go to a flop house tonight. And thank heaven I can build a fire on my own and buy something that's infinitely cheaper and infinitely better and cook it myself than to go into some stupid hash joint. Gee, I was glad to hear from you. Believe it or not, pal, I just received your letter today. It must have followed me all over the world. But it got to my wife, and she wrote it open and read it and sent it to me this morning. Well, I came back to East and run into a shotgun wedding, and I was the ghost. Now, I think my music is intrinsically corporeal. That It has a body feeling about it. I care what the instruments look like. They are pieces in space. They are spatial products. And being in space, they have to look great. They have to be inspiring all by themselves. Then the man who, the man or woman who plays that instrument is a part of the instrument. It's a oneness. It's a wholeness. And uh, by God, if I have anything to say about it, he's not going to look like a, uh, an amateur California prune picker. I've never had the feeling I was competing with anyone. It is my aim to hold an audience, just as any playwright wants to hold his audience, just as Euripides wanted to hold his audience. I've built three Katharas since 1938, and these three are probably the first that have been built in the last 1,500 years. The Kathara is a lyre, the instrument used by the professional Greek musician. The lyre of Orpheus had three strings. The traditional number of strings was eight, but lyres were experimented with, of course. One of the very famous experimenters was Timotheus from Sparta, of all places, who increased the number of Cathara strings from 8 to 12. For the crime of 12 strings, the Spartans drove the immoral Timotheus from their city. He had failed to realize that to dream of desirable changes is one thing, to act upon those dreams is another. My Cathara has 72 strings. And I shudder to think what might have happened to me in ancient Greece. But when someone does something different these days, we simply ignore him to death. We don't have to exile. But I recall going to a to the very first Los Angeles Philharmonic, the very first one, I think it was 1919. It was a new organization. And uh, I recall this great body of blue-haired ladies sitting below me. And 45 years later, mind you, 
I went to another concert in the same city, and behold, the sea of blue. Now, there's nothing wrong with blue-haired red ladies, of course. But if we aren't concerned about our youth, we're headed straight to a dead end. Two, three, four. I'd like to do it again. Two, three, four. One, two, three, four. I mean, you can't tilt it constantly. Oh, okay. you, it's got to be at a constant angle. That's better. There you go. Good. Oh, that, that's yeah, using that's... a buckle sound. I don't know, there must be a way.
upon a time, there was a little boy, and he went outside. On the wall of the projection room of a company specializing in children's films are inscriptions of appreciation. And the children had drawn and painted these inscriptions, and the one that I remembered so well. I didn't write it down, I didn't have to, because I, well, in a sense, I thought of it as myself. And once upon a time, there was a little boy and he went outside, because that's exactly what I did. When I was pretty young, I've been going outside ever since. I went outside in the big ranch country of Arizona and almost got bitten by a rattlesnake and uh, a thousand other things. And then later I went outside of music. I guess I'm still going outside. But I'm not a little boy any longer. a great difference between the the generation of youth 40 or 50 years ago and the present years as witnessed by uh, my walks across the Brooklyn Bridge or the Manhattan Bridge where I saw obscene signs and obscene drawings constantly and my walks down the Encinitas Beach here where there's a stairway up the cliff and there's nothing but peace love peace stuff. <laughs> Love, oh love, oh careless love, slow stroke. Love, oh love, oh careless love. Love, oh love, some number coming up, little careless love. You see what love has done to me. Good. I can't keep that. That's good. <laughs> My mother sang Chinese lullabies. I've forgotten them totally. How well, I remembered I remembered one until I was in my twenties, but of course Rock of Age is a near my God to thee, I hear constantly. And it, it's all around. We we can't miss these things. But nobody reminds me of Chinese lullaby. <laughs> I, I sure I could write to Mao Zedong and get a book up. How about the Indian and, music? Uh, yes, the Indian, the Yaki Indians. I certainly heard them, and of course other music, hymns, Chinese lullabies, and other Chinese songs. There were a lot of them, and lots of Mexican things because we were very close to the border. During the Depression, when one was put upon his own resources so constantly, nobody was writing war and peace, and nobody was doing an unfinished symphony. But in little ways, there was a tremendous amount of creativity. Now, when I say creative, I, I'm, I don't mean poetry or literature or music or any of the things that we think of as the fine arts. I'm just talking about everyday living, like primitive man. Like primitive man. He, he didn't consider something he carved to be fine art. We think of it as fine art sometimes now, but he didn't. When you lived on the farm, you said that your dad used to have a wood shop. Well, it wasn't a farm, it was a ranch. It was a ranch? Yeah. Yes, well, he always had a wood shop, and so I could use common tools when I was five or six without... Somebody said, uh, watch your thumb. I was hammering a nail. I said, I haven't hit my thumb in 30 years. <laughs> Now we're beginning to get a coupling. You hear it down there? Well, by God, I do. Okay, closer. There you go. Now it's coupling. Come on, somebody say something. Don't you hear that yeah, coupling? Yes, yeah. I hear it. Yours is high and he's low. Now, can you get level? Okay. Now bring it up just slowly. vibrate at virtually the same frequency as this cavity. And so you can say, you can say, the tongue must couple with the cavity or there's no resonant tone. And uh, yes, this is very sexy. Music is sexy, acoustics is sexy, nature is sexy. Uh, when I go along a mountain, 
for trail. And I see a stream and I'm thirsty. I plunge into it head first almost to get a drink of water. As a matter of fact, uh, it said that Julius Caesar picked his soldiers that way. He would, they, they would cross the stream. They were all thirsty. And the soldiers he wanted are the ones who just plunge down, belly down, and stick their faces into that water. And uh, the ones who went and got a cut before they would take a drink of water, well, Pompey and Mark Antony could have those soldiers as far as Caesar was concerned. Terry and I are very close, emotionally and artistically. I remember him telling us that we not only had to caress the instruments, to be dramatically correct, but also to rate the instruments too when the, the situation called for it. Other composers in this century have invented new instruments and they've looked outside the culture to examine the rituals of non-Western man. Harry's done this also, but he's also brought a, a tuning system that gives a complete tonal gamut of, of dissonance and consonance. To this, he's built a whole new orchestra of instruments in a multimedia presentation. Okay, and then it goes over here. Oh no, that's not right. That's... I can't get it up that high, but... fact that the wine and liquor bottles will give approximately the same frequency under each brand name. For example, the lowest tone is an old Heaven Hill sour mash. The top is a uh, Bristol cream sherry. And uh, if you run out, if you don't get exactly this, the right tone here or the right tone here, you simply ask your friends to save your old Heaven Hill or whatever bottles. This is the spoils of war, so named because of the seven brass artillery casings hanging here. And how much better to have them hang here than shredding young men's bodies on the battlefield. I can remember my brother and me, he was 10 years older, but we watched some, some bad men, so-called. And I, I was always for the bad men. Not, I didn't have any real reason except that the idea of retribution was a ghastly idea to me. That, that, that whatever they had done, here they were being trapped, hunted and trapped. And I'd seen my father and sister hunt animals. And I had this terrible feeling about anyone who was hunted. Anyhow, this is the blow boy. It takes me back a long time ago to southern Arizona and hearing the steam engine pulling a freight through the pass 60 miles away. Oh, well. memories are Arizona and the Old West and Tombstone. No, I don't remember Tombstone, but I certainly remember Benson and the totally different kind of place it was. It was the Old West, the dying gasps of the Old West. I was a small child in a town in Arizona. And I recall many benches along the plank and roofed over sidewalks. They were in front of the post office, where you sat down to read your mail. In front of the little bank, and in front of every saloon, a little anodyne for peace, 
conquered comfort. No signs. Today, ah, there are signs around the post office. Do not loiter. Around other public buildings. Do not loiter. Even in public parks, where a couple of people want to improve the darkness with a little loving. Now isn't that nice and friendly? I would choose to be anonymous. Of course. I, I, I'm, I'm thinking of the there's fantastic cave drawings in, in France and southern France and in northern Spain, Altamira, I think it is. And there's no author there. Look, what a treasure they are. And, and uh, who, who cares who wrote? How many thousand years, years ago was that? No, well, of course, I'm not saying that anything I'm going to do is going to last that long. But who cares? what the name was.